Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. We explain to you what is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Essentially, we make you sound smarter when you talk with your friends. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, subscribe on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. In exchange for your support, our program, uh, for in supporting our program, we give you all kinds of bonus content and freebies. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Uh, we dive deep into analyzing current events in society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, and the language can sometimes be strong and offensive. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. Uh, this is a rare We Are Libertarians. Normally, we have a whole cast and crew of people. Uh, we're streaming to Dear Leaders Court, our Patreon-only subscriber group for those who donate $10 up a month. Uh, but tonight, we are streaming to uh, our big Facebook page, and so many of you are seeing us for the first time, and welcome. And uh, I am no normally ga uh, Harry is here on Tuesday night, or Greg or Cat are or are playing backup. But tonight I'm by myself interviewing a good friend of mine. His name is Travis Irvine, and he is documentarian. He uh, is the he just made American Mare, which you can find on Amazon Prime. Let me bring Travis in. Travis, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I we've been Facebook friends, I think, since you ran for mayor. When did you run for mayor of what town and where? Oh, gosh. Uh, I ran for mayor of my suburb town, uh, Bexley, Ohio. It's a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and that was 10 years ago, Chris. 10 years ago when I was just a dumb 24-year-old kid with dreadlocks. Now you're a dumb 34-year-old with semi-normal hair. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, now, what do you do for a living? You you are a comedian, a documentarian. What are what are some of the things that you're involved in? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm basically a, a journalist, a filmmaker, a stand-up comedian, and a political activist and consultant, usually on the libertarian side of things. Uh, and in between all four of those things, I've somehow made a living for uh, about 10 years now. So um, it's kind of exciting to see it all culminate and kind of blend together. And, uh, you know, the documentary American Mayor is kind of the perfect uh, combination of all of those things. So you ran for mayor 10 years ago of, of a small town outside of Columbus, Ohio, and you're just now getting the documentary out? <laughs> is that, how did it, why did it, what took it you so long, essentially, I'm asking? <laughs> well, I would love to say that I was just on libertarian time, but um, there was actually a, a whole process that we went through. Um, we shot the documentary in 2007, that's when the race was, uh, spoiler alert, uh, I do not win, but you should still watch the documentary because uh, there there's a lot of good lessons as to why everyone absolutely should get involved with the local political process. Uh, if if not, keep getting involved more so from there. Um, and uh, you know, it took us about two years to edit down the documentary. We had about 16 to 17 hours of footage. Uh, originally, so 2008, 2009, I actually relocated outside of Ohio to D.C. and New York City, and um, that's where we finished the documentary. First, we made it a, an 80-minute epic, and it went nowhere. No festivals took it, so uh, we brought in a, a filmmaker, another filmmaker friend of mine, who helped us cut it down to 40 minutes, and that makes it technically a short film uh, by the standards of the Academy. And uh, so once it was a short film, that's when we started to get into film festivals in 2010, um, uh, including the Cannes Film Festival, Atlanta International DocuFest, and the Palm Springs Short Film Festival. And from that festival run, we got a distribution deal uh, with a company uh, called Indie Media Entertainment out of Irvine, California, which I thought was a great name and a good sign. Uh, but then these people at Indie Media Entertainment just stole the movie from us for four years, and they uh, didn't give us any money at all. They distributed it on their website and on Amazon.com, and um, and then gave us none of the money. In fact, uh, 
we finally had our uh, got a lawyer and we checked on everything. They are no longer allowed to operate in the state of California because they did not pay their taxes. I guess they are also very libertarian, and uh, <laughs> but you know they also never paid us. So um, thanks to the improvement of technology, because the movie was already on Amazon, um, the last three years we've been working on basically. Uh, with a lawyer and all legal, uh, getting all the legal ducks in order, we've taken back the movie, and uh, we've got it now on Amazon ourselves. And thankfully, the, you know, now uh, Amazon has improved to the point where you have Amazon Prime, and and people can watch it that way. So it's a uh, it's been a journey, but uh, I'll be honest, Chris. You know, after the 2016 election, I think there's no better time for this documentary. I feel like 2017 is a good year for young people, uh, millennials, good, honest working people, um, you know, libertarians on the right and, and progressive Bernie Sanders people on the left to both get involved with the electoral process and start uh, changing uh, our government for the better. It's hard to uh, – sometimes when you have a friend who asks you to watch their stuff, you go, oh, no, <laughs> because you never know what you're going to get. But, but I watched it, and I genuinely enjoyed it, and I thought that it was uh, really good – uh, it was a really good documentary. It was a really good example of what goes into a libertarian race from start to finish. Uh, it, it Can you kind of give us a summation of what happens? I mean, don't give away all the surprises, but just a, a summation of the plot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a good point. Um, you know, again, I was kind of just... Uh, 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 yeah, an ambitious uh, filmmaker, comedian, 24 years old. Um, I had actually just moved back home after going to college, like any good broke millennial would. And uh, I was kind of questioning what I wanted to do with my life because I knew I wanted to make movies, but I knew I was interested in politics. And um, essentially, this opportunity opened up uh, in the southwest corner of my hometown of Bexley there uh, in Ohio, where uh, my neighbors were having a problem with City Hall. Essentially, uh, the southwest corner of Bexley didn't have any representation within City Hall or on City Council. Um, and my neighbors had uh, essentially an issue with the local university, where the local university was uh, buying up properties, buying up homes, and then essentially colluding with people in City Hall to get uh, zoning approvals where they could knock down the homes and build up dorms in the neighborhood. So um, slowly, starting about 2003, 2005, the neighborhood I grew up in started to get demolished house by house, and they were building up parking lots and dorms. The, um, currently, there's a giant dorm room right next door to my parents' house there in Ohio. Um, and that's what the issue was. So uh, what changed in 2007 was, again, I was back from college, but uh, our, our mayor, who had been mayor for 30 years, you know, uh, uh, somewhat of a career politician, I will say everybody loved him, so did I, but uh, he was retiring. And um, so I saw that as an opportunity basically to run a message campaign and, and jump in the mayor's race and speak up for my neighbors and let everyone know about what happened. And, uh, and what was happening within the southwest corner of Bexley. And, you know, you, you see it in the documentary. A lot of people in Bexley had no idea. A lot of my opponents, you know, I was running against seven other people uh, for mayor of Bexley because uh, it's a nonpartisan race and the winner just has to win by one vote. Um, so it was a very active year for democracy in Bexley in 2007. But, um, it, you know, essentially by speaking up on this issue, um, I don't want to, again, Spoil, spoil anything, but it helped it uh, get resolved just by speaking up for something that I cared about and for speaking up uh, for people who I wanted to represent. Um, and I will say, since then, the southwest corner of Bexley uh, has a lot more rep representation thanks to just this, you know, uh, a campaign run by a 24-year-old kid with dreadlocks. Yeah, that's one of the benefits. So oftentimes what I've found, and, and you've traveled around Libertarian Party circles, what I found is oftentimes you, you, you may not win, but there are t intangibles to running for office as a libertarian that aren't often uh, seen. So what are some of the outcomes of your race? You know, besides, I think you, we won't say what place you came in, but did you see any of your ideas co-opted by your competitors? 
Oh my goodness, yeah. Well, um, you know, 2007 was my introduction to the Libertarians and the Libertarian Party. Um, I actually got endorsed by both the uh, Franklin County Libertarian Party as well as the Central Ohio Green Party. So um, I was, uh, you know, working both ends of the uh, the political spectrum. But you know, of course, as we found out in 2016. Um, you know, Bernie people and Libertarian people actually do agree on a bunch of stuff. Um, but at a local level, it, it certainly counted as well. You know, I, I focused on issues of, um, you know, making uh, zoning laws, um, you know, a little essentially beneficial to everyone, you know, all citizens, not just the powerful uh, university, essentially. And uh, I also focused on greening policies of the of the state op or the uh, excuse me the city operations, which actually would save money in the long run, um, and things like that. So I I was focusing on some uniquely libertarian and green ideas, kind of environmentally uh, money saving ideas, and uh, some of them actually did get imp implicated. Uh, I remember the big issue in 2007 was that we needed a new police station. The old one. Uh, was just you know too old and it was leaking. It wasn't adequate for the police anymore. So uh, when the discussion came to building the new one, uh, I was the one who inserted the idea of making it uh, environmentally friendly, making it a LEED certified building. And they actually ended up doing that. And now it's it's you know probably the cheapest building that the city owns because it's uh, it's all environmentally friendly and they save a bunch of money on it. So that's one idea. Um, I think you know again the bigger thing for me is the fact that. Um, you know, two years after I ran in 2007, there was a, a guy down the street um, in the southwest corner of Bexley who actually ran for city council. You know, he, he has an actual house and a family and a job and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, important things for city council members to have. Uh, and he actually won. So um, we, we've got, I think, two or three uh, now uh, representatives on city council since I ran in 2007. And even my mom and a, fel a few other neighbors were put on uh, city commissions, zoning commissions, in fact. So um, the impact had a lasting uh, impact uh, even 10 years later, which is uh, pretty cool. Yeah, I apologize to our Facebook Live audience. We have we had some audio issues, so there's some technical difficulties. So I appreciate your uh, long answer there because it gave me a chance to try and find a fix. Uh, so one of the one I I, I, I got really pissed at the beginning of your documentary. I was I was just like I was pissed off because you had dreadlocks. <laughs> and and it is yeah i know they're pretty gross i know well it's not that it's not just the dreadlocks okay here's here's my issue having been the executive director of the libertarian party of indiana for four years and working with candidates you get a lot of candidates who come along who have a lot of ideas about how to run for office and their ideas for getting attention you know i'll wear a hawaiian shirt in the televised debate and that's not what people really want. They they don't want wacky. They want irreverent but serious at the same time. And so when you started to run for office with dreadlocks and T-shirts and like your interview with the local paper, it just I I was just like oh because th here's the weird thing about libertarians is that uh, Republicans and Democrats a aren't held to the same standards by the public that we are and and aren't as easily dismissed, although uh, Donald Trump is far crazier than any Libertarian Party presidential candidate ever put forward. Uh, you you also... <laughs> yes, that's true. Absolutely. And as Libertarians, we also feel responsibility for each other. I always say we're a very codependent movement, and we're always like, we feel the responsibility for the candidate in California who's, you know, or the candidate who's in Ohio with dreadlocks. And you're already at a disadvantage being fairly young. But you you got feedback from your voting base fairly quickly about that. You immediately changed it. And you went on in your campaign to have a pretty irreverent and funny style in both the debate and in some of the commercials that you shot. And you you brought that same different outlook and out and view, uh, but in a much more professional way. And I felt that that was a really important lesson for a lot of libertarian candidates. Oh yeah, I, I think it's an important lesson for 
uh, anyone trying to run with a minor party or any outsider, really, any millennial, any, um, you know, working person just trying to get involved with the process. Um, yeah, you do have to take yourself a little seriously. You saw there's a, a transformation um, in the documentary where I was almost starting like a joke, you know, as I was a comedian, um, a filmmaker, I'm just naturally, uh, usually a goofball in most situations. Um, but yeah, this was a situation, uh, to, to take seriously, you know, it was like, all right, if I wanted to represent my neighbors and actually, you know, we're talking about saving houses here, we're talking about saving homes, um, so families' lives don't get worse. I think that really kicked in for me. Um, you know, there's even things that we didn't catch on film, like my dad having a heart to heart with me about, okay, are you are you doing this to win? Are you doing this seriously? What's going on? You know, there there were off camera things too that also pushed me in the direction of you know getting the haircut, going to city council meetings, learning what I was talking about, and uh, you know, like I said in the documentary, becoming a candidate that my neighbors deserved. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good lesson, libertarian. Greens, reforms, um, again, you know, nonpartisan races, uh, any millennial, any honest, decent, non political person looking to get involved, yeah, you know, take it seriously. But at the same time, stay true to yourself. And I think that's what I try to do, as you saw later throughout the, the rest of the documentary. Yeah, it, it was. <laughs> You started to really seem like it seemed like you main, gained some traction, and and you probably went through what a lot of libertarian candidates go through, where everybody starts telling you how well you're doing and how much they want to vote for you and how they are going to vote for you, and you start to kind of believe your own press a little bit, and then when your friend tells you the results, you're just kind of dumbfounded a little bit. And I thought you were a very gracious loser in the way that you yeah. you treated your opponent. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you definitely have to um, you have to buy into these things. You really do have to run to win, you know. We saw that last year with Gary Johnson. He was he was running to win, even though deep down he really just wanted to get the 5% so the Libertarian Party, uh, you know, could be recognized on, as a national party. And, you know, state by state, you know, the percentages he got actually did help get the Libertarian Party registered as a as a political party and, and secured ballot access in a lot of states where they didn't have that before. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I definitely think that uh, you got to keep the goals realistic. Um, I Again, I was running against seven other people, so we did think somehow there could be some crazy, uh, you know, eight-way split where somehow I uh, scooted home <laughs> to victory. But, um, you know, again, you see that on election night, you've seen it. In the 10 years since I ran, uh, and, and like we talked about, sometimes the win is not necessarily, uh, you know, the numbers and the actual getting into office. It's about influencing the discussion. Um, you know, the guy that won, John Brennan, um, he sadly has actually uh, passed away since the documentary. Um, but, you know, for four years, I could go to City Hall and I could just sit down and, and talk to the mayor of my hometown. Uh, about what was going on in my corner. You know, we became buddies, essentially, uh, uh, mainly thanks to a lot of those debates. You know, again, we didn't, we had to cut a lot of the footage, but uh, anytime I said anything funny in the debates, uh, John Brennan, the guy who ended up uh, winning, uh, was saying things that were even funnier than me. So that's that's kind of how we made a connection. And, and sure enough, he's the one that put my mom and, and a bunch of other neighbors on zoning commissions. You know, it's crazy, but all politics is absolutely local. You know, when you know the mayor, when you know the people in city council, you can walk on down there and, and tell them what's on your mind. And so it's, it's, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool, really, when it works. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the benefits that I've seen with candidates over the years is that by running for office, they really bond with their opponents because you're you're in the same fight together and there is a competitive spirit but and you kind of hate each other and then you get to the debates and you meet them for the first time after hating them for like a year and you go oh and these guys are actually all right they're nice <laughs> and you kind of bond and you switch numbers and you get to know them a little bit and then your influence can grow afterwards i think that's awesome that your your ability to connect with the people that and, and several of the other people who ran for mayor also went on to serve in pretty high up parts of the administration. I mean, this this didn't seem like a big town. It seems like a, a smallish suburb, a college town outside of Columbus, right? So we're not we're not talking about a very uh, widespread uh, mega city, but it, it can be even in Indianapolis where we're where we're at. 
you can get to know everybody pretty well. And, you know, when I was head of the Libertarian Party, I knew the mayor of Indianapolis and I could, you know, get to him reasonably quickly and have a conversation with him. So it is when you're engaged in political activity, you do get to know the people who do wield power, even if you yourself don't win and end up wielding power. So that's a huge benefit. And I think your documentary, American Mayor, which you can find on Amazon Prime, really displays that very well, Travis. Oh, thank you. No, I, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I've seen that with libertarian candidates, with Green Party candidates. Um, when you're involved at all, you definitely have a, a bond uh, with your opponents, it's like you said, even if you for years have hated their guts, um, you know, you talk about you know, what, I, what I've done since the, the mayor run, but um, I've stayed involved with the Libertarian Party. I, I ran as a congressional candidate in 2010, and I think that's what put me uh, more so on the radar of uh, the Libertarian Party National. And, you know, we made a lot of fun videos that went viral with Libertarian uh, in libertarian circles on the internet and everything. But, you know, 2010, um, I, you know, by the end of that race, you know, I think at the beginning, my, my Republican opponent was attacking me saying I was a Democrat. I was a secret Democrat, um, because I had interned for Chuck Schumer one time, a long time ago, um, on Capitol Hill, um, and things like that. But, um, by the end of that race, I mean, we were like buds, you know, we would, we would talk and I would joke with him. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter if I disagree with them uh, on, on a number of issues. It's still pretty cool that um, my, my own congressman knows my name, knows my face, and, um, and I can talk to him about things that I felt millennials really cared about at a national level. Um, so you're absolutely right. You know, uh, on the small town uh, level, there's obviously, you know, uh, people in my hometown all still know me. I, I know the current mayor. Uh, we had a great screening of the documentary at my hometown theater there in Bexley, Ohio, the historic Drexel Theater. And uh, the mayor was there. A former state senator was there. The current city councilman was there. Um, a Green Party guy who's run for office every year was there. So, um, you know, it is very cool. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, just by putting yourself out there, you are um, putting yourself in a, in a class um, with other politicians that, you know, you can kind of be the truth teller, you know, you can kind of be the, uh, the fun one if you want, you know, but you still have an impact and, uh, you know, your voice is still heard. We're talking with Travis Irvine. He is the uh, documentarian, the libertarian filmmaker behind American Mara on Amazon Prime TV. Uh, so I I do have a regret, a regret on your behalf. You know, you, you went on and you wanted to do something differently, but I thought that one of the council members, the city council members saying, you should run for council uh, or, or run for mayor again, but run for council and I think you'd win, but you chose to run for Congress. And this is what I tell when I meet with candidates privately. I say, hey, you plan to run for two or three cycles or start big and then go down one step to city council or, you know, run for city council and then mayor. You know, run, plan to run multiple cycles because you have to do that because of ballot laws, because of just the virtue of being a third party candidate. Uh, you chose to run for Congress as opposed to running for city council where you probably might have had a better shot at winning. Why did you make that choice? Um, no, it's a very good point. You know, we have a lot of libertarians kind of jumping at a higher level than they should. Um, I think that choice was made because I was only kind of temporarily in my hometown after graduating and with no real direction to go. So I actually moved to D.C. Um, after the mayor's race. Um, um, that was actually for that, that internship with Chuck Schumer. Uh, ended up leaving that within a few months and got a job with Matthew Lesko, the fun infomercial question mark suit guy. Um, and then after that, I moved to New York. Um, so I wasn't really destined to be back in my uh, hometown until 2010, when that's when the Congress race was. And that essentially came from the fact that um, in 2008, the Libertarians ran a, a lovely man uh, named Steve, Steve Linneberry. We all love Steve, um, but he was in the televised debate, and I watched the televised debate, and he was so bad um, that <laughs> I essentially just wrote the Libertarians immediately, just like, hey, um, you know, if you guys need candidates who can just talk on TV, um, you know, know how to do that kind of stuff. I've run a race and already, and so uh, I feel I could 
be of help with that. So that was more of a um, making sure that the Libertarians had a full slate in 2010. And I will say the Libertarian Party of Ohio at at the time in 2010, we really had our shit together. Um, you know, we had a full statewide slate of candidates. We had congressional candidates in most of the districts. Um, and so I think that's more so what they're looking for that year. So, but you're absolutely right. I do look back and think, okay, what if I had prepared myself to just stay in my hometown for those two years? I ran in 2009. You know, uh, who knows? Eight years later, what would have been different? Would I be mayor? Would I be a state rep? I don't know. But, um, you know, it, it's, well, at this point, I can't really say. Um, you know, I, if, if anything else, I will say that, you know, here we are at a point where the Libertarian Party of Ohio, you know, as prime as they were in 2010 and 2012, they've been completely taken down. I don't know if you want to get into that at all uh, by the Republicans in Ohio by some ridiculous uh, ballot access legislation that the Republicans passed in 2013 and got upheld in 2014. So, unfortunately, the Libertarian Party of Ohio, we were so good for, for so long, and then the Republicans just cut us down by changing the rules. You know, they moved the goalposts in the middle of the ball game, essentially. And, uh, you know, Gary Johnson didn't even run in Ohio as a libertarian in 2016. He had to run as an independent. So, um, you know, I, it, it is an interesting thing. I kind of have to pick my battles. You know, uh, for the moment, my neighbors are fine with the representation we have in City Hall uh, back home in, in Bexley, Ohio. But, um, you know, since then and, and until this day, really, uh, my focus has been on trying to help out the Libertarian Party of Ohio. Yeah, let's talk about that because I was in the uh, adjoining state here in Indiana, Indiana and Ohio touch for those of you who are geographically challenged. And, you know, I was the full time executive director of Indiana, our strongest uh, affiliate at the time and still kind of is, is Wayne County right on the Ohio border. And I got to know a lot of our friends over in Ohio. Kevin Nedler was the chair at the time. Jess Mears was down in Cincinnati along with Jillian Mack. Jess now works for the National Libertarian Party. You had a lot of great candidates, a lot of activity, a lot of strong campaigns like yours and some others, and it really was a, a hard state to beat. I mean, we were we were still beating you guys on a lot of different things, but the friendly competition and shared resources over the border uh, and helping each other and, and working with our, our two state chairs working together, it's really a great, great time for the Libertarian Party of Indiana and Ohio between 2010 and 2012. And then you guys just started getting killed by the India by the uh, governor of Ohio, the legislature there. Can you explain what happened because I, I'm I, I know it was pretty bad, but I don't I don't have all the details. so I'd love to hear more about that. And if you're in Ohio, uh, this will piss you off. So Travis, what happened? Well, it all started, again, you know, we were top of our game in 2010 and 2012. 2012, um, you know, I, I did some rallies. Uh, I was the MC for Gary uh, down in Cincinnati. We had another one in Cleveland. And it really was one of Gary's favorite states to campaign in. Um, and that's because, again, we just, we had it together. And then in 2013... Um, when I believe John Kasich started to uh, really start to think about running for president in 2016, he first had to get reelected handedly in 2014. So um, the Republicans who have, you know, always, uh, anytime as a Republican secretary of state, they would always try to change the rules within the Secretary of State. The Libertarian Party of Ohio would sue the Secretary of State, and we would always win because the Secretary of State cannot make um, ballot access laws. You, you know, they cannot create legislation. So the Republicans, uh, the Republicans, having learned this lesson um, in 2013, rammed through a new minor uh, party ballot access law called SB 93, Senate Bill 93 in 2013, and they rammed it through, and of course Governor Kasich signed it, because what it was, it was new rules essentially for minor parties to exist in the state of Ohio, and that was you need to get 3% in a gubernatorial race or a presidential race for your party to be a, an official uh, recognized uh, party in the state. Um, if you did not meet those criteria, then you'd have to get a percentage of the total vote from the previous election. So, for example, um, uh, some five uh, million or something uh, voted in uh, in Ohio in 2016. So we've got to get 
Now we've got to get 1% of those signatures, which is about uh, 53,000 valid signatures to become a registered political party again. So if any other minor party, not just the Libertarians, wants to become a registered political party, they need to first turn in these signatures, you know, 50,000 or more uh, to become a party. And then they must get 3% in the gubernatorial or the presidential election. So those rules, the new legislation was passed in 2013 in Ohio by the uh, the Ohio uh, legislature dominated by the Republican Party. And um, what that legislation was found unconstitutional because it was in the midst of the 2014 gubernatorial campaign already. So the courts actually said – this law cannot be imposed until after 2014. Okay, good. We won there. But guess what? They actually had a, the Republicans had another ace up their sleeves, and that is that they um, basically uh, duped a registered libertarian in Ohio to challenge our governor candidate, Charlie Earl's signatures on an old law that has never been enforced before, which regards the petition gatherer's signatures on the back of the petitions. That's how they challenged them in a court of law with the uh, secretary of state. And with that, they, they basically won. Uh, the court case was drawn out past the 2014 election, um, meaning our, you know, we couldn't even win to get on the ballot in time. Um, but it, it was a moot point at that point, whether we won or not, because they were able to essentially kick Charlie Earl off the ballot off a complete technical um, that had never been enforced before. They did so by literally finding some registered libertarian and paying. There's actually bills. There's actually a paper trail to be found that a Republican um, operative named Terry Casey actually paid for all of these legal bills so this nobody registered libertarian could uh, challenge Charlie Earl's signatures. And that's how they got us kicked off of the 2014 ballot. And so guess what? It's pretty hard to get 3% of the gubernatorial vote when you're not on the ballot. So as of uh, after 2014, the Libertarian Party of Ohio is no more. It is merely a, a committee, and uh, that's how we got Gary Johnson on the ballot as an independent, and that is how we are gathering our signatures now for the governor's race in 2018, in which uh, a vital 3% is necessary to make the Libertarian Party of Ohio a recognized political party again. Wow, that is... Uh... <laughs> That is a whole lot of horseshit. Uh, that is really stunning, and it just yeah, it's heart. I mean, it's heartbreaking, man. They just they don't want competition. It's amazing, and it's always Republicans, you know, because whatever left libertarians want to say, the libertarian party and most libertarians, like if you look at the back end of the analytics of our Facebook page. It really is a lot of people who were Republicans, who are done with the Republican Party, who never, who don't, their values don't align with the current Republican Party, especially not Donald Trump, especially uh, not in terms of the foreign policy. Uh, and so they they are fairly right center, uh, center right. And so the Republicans obviously feel a lot more threatened. Uh, but those people aren't going to vote for Republicans anymore anyways. They may vote for one or two that they know and they like, but they're not, by and large, going to vote for Republicans anymore. And it's really just such a dirty trick to kick libertarians off their ballot because it, it just, it's again, it's Republicans being anti-free speech, anti-competition, because you and I, as American citizens, have the First Amendment right to stand up and run for office, to stand up and petition our government to change it. It, it, it's, it. It's our right to put our name on the ballot and speak freely against the government and allow other citizens to vote for us. And Republicans don't care about the First Amendment. And, and I think we see that in a lot of uh, what the president and vice president are doing with the NFL stuff right now. Uh, you know, the president today wanted to, wants to start taking legal action against the, the NFL and because of the free speech of players, which is just shocking to me. And then you also have uh, the anti-competition element. I mean, you go back to Medicare Part D, where the Republicans crafted this free market Medicare fix and it gave you three choices for your prescription drugs. You know, and that's not, you know, George Bush coming out and saying, well, this is free market at work. Well, no, the government chose three people, and then you get to choose what the, who the government chose. That's not free market. Uh, so 
it's it's just really disheartening and i am so hopeful that the supreme court does take on gerrymandering and does rule gerrymandering to be uh un- unconstitutional even though it was <laughs> gerrymandering's elbridge gary from massachusetts or connecticut uh who was one of the f- signers of the declaration and the constitution as soon as the Constitution ink dried, he started gerrymandering, and that's where the, the, the term comes from. So it is as old as the Republic, but it is just uh, another tool in the tool belt of politicians where they they write their own antitrust laws in many of these ballot access rules. And it's and I want to sit here and kick and scream that it's not fair, but it's not not just not fair, it's unjust and it's un-American, Travis. Oh, I, I absolutely agree, Chris. I mean, good Lord. Uh, you know, it reminds me of a classic line that many of us would use in 2010 that the Republicans go around and campaign like libertarians and then they get in power and they legislate like Democrats. I mean, it's just it's a misnomer that these guys are conservative or pro-liberty or pro-freedom or pro-independence in any right. They're about power. You know, they, they get in there and you see in Ohio, we have ridiculous laws, uh, you know, that that make it harder for small businesses to operate. I mean, they, they literally, the laundry list of things that you get fined for and they're, are illegal now in Ohio were all passed by 20 years of Republican leadership. Um, you know, in 2014, I'll just say the big reason, again, is because um, our candidate was Charlie Earl. Charlie Earl was a former state representative um, who was definitely a libertarian-leaning Republican in the 80s, and he served with John Kasich. He served with Mike DeWine and all these guys who would go on to become senators and governors. Um, and they were afraid of Charlie. They were afraid of Charlie calling them out on their bull. Uh, and that's why they didn't want him on the ballot. That's why they didn't even want to force John Kasich uh, having to go face Charlie in a debate or anything like that. Um, so that's really why they took them out. They were afraid of our candidate. So, um, you know, we'll see what they've got in store for us in 2018. We are gathering the signatures. Um, uh, you know, I, I am certainly, I'm going to put forth uh, my name uh, as a gubernatorial candidate. With We have to get 3% uh, next year. And we're going to go through every single process that we have to. And we're going to fight the Republicans tooth and nail to make it happen so we can have a Libertarian Party presidential nominee on the ballot in the state of Ohio in 2020. All right. Again, we are talking to Travis Irvine of the documentary American Mayor on Amazon Prime. Please go check it out. Uh, I, I want to ask you what you're up to now. And our And my final question here, I mean, what what are you working on professionally? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, this documentary is finally uh, out there, you know, after 10 years of, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, trying to figure out where it goes. But it's great to have it out there. Um, uh, I currently split my time between Ohio and, and New York. I've got a lot of work in New York still. Um, you can still see a lot of my work on uh, Vice and Vice Land, the TV channel. Um, and I'm currently working on another documentary with uh, that features Jeff Ross from Comedy Central. So we're very excited about that one. Um, that kind of delves into the Medicaid world, the uh, the gambling world, and, and things like that, and how the, those institutions treat the elderly. Um, so that's one thing we're working on. I'm also working on bringing a feature uh, film. Uh, I made a feature-length film uh, when I was in college at Ohio University about killer raccoons, and it was picked up by a cult, uh, the cult distributor Troma Entertainment. So we are currently in development for a sequel to that, which I would love to shoot in Ohio. Um, in fact, this is another great issue to talk about with the state of Ohio is uh, is uh, tax incentives for films to be shot there. You know, Ohio is currently losing out on millions of dollars on film productions to uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania and even Kentucky. Ugh. Uh, which um, essentially because uh, we don't have good tax incentives uh, for Films Ohio. So that's what I'm working on uh, now, and I'm certainly uh, interested in working with the Libertarian Party of Ohio on this crucial gubernatorial race. Um, again, I, I am uh, potentially I'm interested um, in becoming the candidate uh, for governor of Ohio next year. Um, I am going to go through the processes uh, to do that. Um, so that's a project to potentially look out for next year. And, uh, beyond that, you know, I'm just, uh, still doing standup comedy, which I think keeps me grounded. You know, that's what kind of keeps everything, uh, fun 
and but also uh, you know it keeps me sane i think to kind of go around and, and tell jokes uh, all around the country and uh, i finally got a, a comedy album out as well that we could plug uh, it's a uh, guy from ohio it's uh, from on tour records uh, which is actually a label out of kentucky they got a lot of great midwest comics so i'm really excited that my my debut comedy album guy from ohio is available on itunes and spotify from them and now we got this uh, the documentary american mayor on amazon as well so it's nice to finally have some uh, some work out there and i'm just going to keep going from here what was Matthew Lesko like, the uh, question mark uh, government tax break guy? You said you weren't with him. What was, what's he like in real life? <laughs> yeah, and you can actually you can see it in one of my um, campaign commercials in 2010. He pops up in one of those videos. Um, he's he's a sweetheart, man. He's a uh, you know he's a, a, a self made millionaire. But the fascinating thing about him is that he's a capitalist for socialism. He would literally take government programs, copy and paste them, put them in a book, and then sell them to people because the government wasn't allowed to advertise the programs. So he literally was just a capitalist for socialist programs, which I, I you know I've never seen anyone uh, become a millionaire that way. It's very unique. Um, the only weird thing about him is that he will literally always wear one of those question mark suits, no matter where you meet him, no matter where he is. He exercises in question mark exercise outfits. He drives a question mark covered car. He drives a question mark covered scooter. Um, but he was always very supportive to me. And you can see it throughout the years. You know, I worked for him in 2008, but he'll pop in and help. Uh, he was in, again, that campaign commercial in 2010. He was in one of my videos for The Guardian uh, about climate change back in 2015. So, you know, he's a great guy. I can only just hit him up again and, and see if he wants to work on anything, and he's usually down. But he will be wearing that suit. That's amazing. Now, I think I saw something on your Facebook, and uh, I don't know if I, I probably should have asked before I brought this up. Did you work with Roger Stone at some point? Yeah, uh, I'm actually starting to make this more public now. I, I've worked with both Roger Stone and I, I worked with James O'Keefe. I worked with both of them uh, from, uh, well, right after I graduated from Columbia Journalism School in 2012. Um, I was the token libertarian at Columbia Journalism School, and that was not easy. But uh, afterwards, uh, landed jobs essentially with Gary's campaign in 2012, James O'Keefe, and, uh, and Roger Stone. So I've worked off and on with Roger and James for the last five years. Yeah, I just watched uh, James O'Keefe just released a new video about uh, the New York Times and the, their video editor, and he's basically like blowing smoke to try and impress this girl, which I could tell he was trying to just puff himself up to, you know, to, to this undercover journalist who probably was under the pretense of them dating. Uh, that, but it was an interesting uh, view, uh, and it's this guy was like worked for the Clinton and Obama campaign, and now he's the head, you know, video guy for the New York Times. So it's really interesting what James O'Keefe is out there doing. I've met Roger a couple times, and I I want to say that I I don't want to say that I, I I guess I do in a weird way respect Roger because he's just so unashamedly pure American politics. And so many people just try to pretend yeah. to be something that they're not. And Roger Stone just says, this is how the game is played. This is who I am. And you can take me or leave me. I don't really give a fuck what you think. And there's something about that that I respect. <laughs> uh, obviously, I don't respect a lot of his tactics. He's done some things as in, in his involvement in the Libertarian Party that I, that I know of that just were like, wow, okay. Uh, but he is... You, when you meet him, you really kind of see why he's gotten to where he's gotten, and that attitude of just being uh, unashamedly me is kind of how he's gotten ahead. I mean, what on a personal basis? Because I've only said hi to him. I don't. I don't have any kind of relationship with him like you do. Uh, he is he a misunderstood person? What is he like when you actually sit down and talk with him? Oh, no, I think you've nailed it. He's absolutely that person 100%. Um, I guess I should clarify that professionally I don't work with Roger and James anymore. I stopped working with James uh, last year. And Roger, I was still on his radio show. Uh, I, I would appear I was the token libertarian millennial on that. Um, but that wrapped up uh, earlier this year. So professionally, I, I don't work with them anymore. But yeah, personally, um, I, I still like Roger and James. I know they're divisive figures. I know they got a lot of people 
people uh, who hate them. I know I have a lot of Democrat, you know, liberal friends who, uh, you know, kind of hated me for even knowing them and even working with them. Um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, they they are who they are. And uh, you know, even James, despite the fact that he works with hidden cameras and disguises and everything, he's is very uniquely him. You know, I respect what James has done and what he's built, and I definitely respect what Rogers, you know, built uh, and the rep- even the reputation he has. You know, he, that's who he is, and he owns that. Um, I'll just point out that yeah, I you know the the great documentary. Um, Get Me Roger Stone on Netflix um, is a must-see for anyone who really wants to understand the American politique. Uh, I, I got cut out of the movie. Uh, I am in the special thanks, but um, all my parts got cut out. Maybe in hindsight, that's okay. <laughs> Some people don't <laughs> overtly know I'm associated with Roger Stone. But um, but I love that movie because that is Roger. And, and may I point out that I will tell my Democrat friends, be like, look, you understand Trump? You got to see this movie. You got to see Get Me Roger Stone. And my friends will be like, no, I hate him. I can't. I don't even want to. I'm like, just do it. Trust me. Watch the movie. And then they will. And I'll get a text and be like, OK, I love Roger Stone. I mean, he's just so fun. And he's so, you know, he he's unashamedly himself. And my favorite thing about hanging out with Roger is, um, in addition to the libertine, things he likes to partake in um he's just got so many stories and so much knowledge so you know when i started working for roger and james alike i saw this as an opportunity to learn and everything that i've learned from james and roger i'm going to take and use it against the republican party in ohio and i'm going to use it for the benefit of the libertarian parties um going forward yeah, I'm a big advocate that we have to play the game, and you you can't sit. Uh, so many people who are converts to the Libertarian Party come from other parties out of disgust, and pretend that there's no uh, there's no political games that ought to be played. That there's no we've got to have fight. And if you want to actually start winning, you know these these people will on the one hand say we need to be different than the Republicans, and Democrats. That's what makes the Libertarian Party special. And then in the next breath say, I don't know if I'm going to stick around because we're not winning. It's it's just a very odd dichotomy and you've got to you know, you you, you political science is not in and of itself quote unquote evil. It's what you do with political science. You've got to do the business of politics and and messaging and communication and advertising and marketing to to really start to get ahead. Uh, Roger, I want you may be a good person to ask to kind of verify one of my theories, but Roger was involved in the Gary Johnson campaign in 2012, and he was going to a lot of Tea Party libertarian things and was around Gary a lot in 2012, traveling a lot. And I've thought all along that it was Roger Stone who really kind of identified this this uh, undercurrent of American politics of just people who feel like they're being stepped on. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But he, he, he kind of really has to be the one in my mind to say to Donald Trump, here's your market. Here are the people that you need to go after. It is the, the white middle class i mean people want to per- portray donald trump's following as some sort of lower class dumb duck dynasty crowd and i'm sure that's part of it but a lot of the people that i've seen at trump rallies are just middle class white america who are just pissed off and 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 feel like they're being left behind and trump has has kind of gathered that audience around himself and messaged to them all along and hit their sweet spot with things like immigration and I think Roger is the one who really identified that market for Donald Trump. I mean, am I close to the mark there? Um, well, you know, you got to, again, uh, you know, in the documentary, uh, Get Me Roger Stone on Netflix, I mean, you can see that the Donald Trump project is something uh, Roger's been working on since 1988. You know, he's been working on it for 30 years. So, uh, yeah, I absolutely think that, you know, I mean, deep down, I do know that Roger Stone is a libertarian. Um, he is very passionate about the the marijuana, uh, the legalization of marijuana issue. Uh, he hates Je- the pick of Jeff Sessions as attorney general for that reason. Um, but, you know, 2012 is when I met Roger. That's how I met him, was working on the Gary Johnson campaign. And, you know, I, I was just a, a fun a goofball millennial who made videos. So he kept me around for, for other political stuff. And uh, 13, 14, 15. Um, we obviously didn't see eye to eye on Trump 
in 2015 and 16. But um, yeah, you do got to wonder. I mean, it's like you said, I, I lost plenty of libertarian friends to uh, the Trump movement uh, in the past year. You know, there are plenty of libertarian people who who jumped ship and uh, and went over to the Trump side. And uh, yeah, I think it's because of that outsider mentality. You know, I mean, look at Trump. He had no political experience whatsoever. And he barged in and he, he it was a hostile takeover of the Republican Party all the way to the convention. Um, and then from there, no one thought he was going to beat Hillary Clinton. And then he did. So, you know, it, it, it is kind of this... Um, this uh, aura of, of doing the impossible, you know, the the small man beating beating the big man, um, and it is interesting that that's an interesting observation, honestly, Chris. I mean, I do wonder what Roger learned from running with Gary. You know, I, I know for a fact Roger never got paid <laughs> by the by the Gary Johnson campaign. He was very bitter about that after, um, but he still respects Gary. And uh, there was actually a moment at the RNC where I was walking around with Roger and he had his documentary crew in tow. And uh, we literally bumped into Gary Johnson and his honorage and his documentary crew in tow. <laughs> and it was a nice moment where they just kind of got to talk and catch up. Um, just like, you know, uh, guys who had, you know, basically gone through the, the, the gamut together uh, four years ago. And, and, you know, you saw they respected each other. I, I really do think Roger wants Trump to be more like Gary Johnson. He wants Trump to be more libertarian. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Roger only has so much influence and Trump is going to do what Trump is going to do. So yeah, take that for, for what it is. But, um, you know, it, it is it is an interesting observation. I think you're right. And, and I do think Roger will continue to work for uh, for libertarian causes, um, despite his his obvious loyalty to Trump. Yeah, I kind of wondered what the if he it was. It's sort of weird that he didn't help with Gary Johnson, but obviously he had loyalty to Trump. But uh, it seems like only Ron Nielsen got paid out of that campaign. But uh, so, all right, so final, yeah. so final uh, pitch for yourself. This is shameless self promotion time. Where can people find you? How can they reach you? Uh, and and you know, what do you want them to do for you? Uh, well, um, I mean, uh, check me out, folks. Um, you know, I uh, I don't know how many libertarian comedian filmmakers there are out there, but, uh, you know, I'm doing what I can to represent. Um, obviously, uh, Chris, I forgot to mention, you and I did the Liberty Tour a year ago. I know. In, uh, there in Indianapolis. Um, or was it in Bloomington? It was, it was at Bloomington. one of the schools. Mm -hmm. it, won, it was, I think it was this one year ago today, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, um, and that actually was great because that linked me up with a, a whole bunch of great libertarians all around the country. You know that Liberty Tour, which um, which was financed by Our America Initiative, um, the the Gary Johnson nonprofit, and uh, which is actually run by Ron Nielsen. So, um, you know, I actually do have a soft spot for all those guys. Uh, they took care of me, and that was um, uh, that was a great tour. I mean, again, we went from. Uh, Maine to Alaska and everywhere in between, and I just got to meet so many uh, cool, motivated libertarians who are doing something neat with the movement. Whether it was you guys doing a podcast or somebody running for office, um, or you know, whether it's Congress or mayor or governor, um, we met all these folks um, just everywhere. And you know, this movement is alive and well. And so I realize that I'm just a part of it. Um, and uh, you know, my my contribution is comedy, movies, and uh, and of course political activism. And if that means running for office again, I am happy to do it. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you can check out my comedy, Guy from Ohio, on iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify. And uh, again, if you're thinking about running for office yourself, absolutely watch American Mayor, my documentary on Amazon and Amazon Prime. Um, I think it can teach you some good lessons and uh, join the movement. We're alive and well. And we're going to keep on going. All right, Travis Irvine, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Spangle, and I am the founder and the, for all intents and purposes, the editor-in-chief of We Are Libertarians. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Facebook page, I just kind of want to introduce who we are. Uh, there, I'm frustrated with the community that we've got here on our Facebook page, so I just wanted to go live. Uh, I'm recording this, so we're going to put this actually on our podcast we are first and foremost a podcast. We started in March of 2012. I was the executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana at the time. I was a full-time political operative for the Libertarian Party, one of just a handful at the time. Now there's almost none. 
uh, various things like ballot access have killed many of the state affiliates. Um, despite me having been, I went on then to work as the marketing director for the Advocates for Self-Government, which is a, uh, the quiz people. If you've taken the world's smallest political quiz, that's who they are. I now work for a nationally syndicated radio show. And over the course of the last, uh, almost, wow, six years, we, we've grown into a multi-channel, multimedia, we're starting to become a company. It's, it's been amazing to take a hobby and turn it into an actual company. And so many of our great fans, we have about 9,000 listeners per episode on We Are Libertarians, which puts us in the top 5% of all podcasts, which um, is somewhere probably half of you know some of the bigger libertarian podcasts still. So it's great to see so many libertarian podcasts have so much success. And that is that is where we do most of our that is the product that we focus on most of the time and uh the the facebook page has has grown and um i i kind of hate our community on it so i wanted to i wanted to do a facebook live to the facebook uh page hoping to have kind of a conversation with many of you uh because it's frustrating to me we have such an amazing audience of listeners who are very engaged in thoughtful political dialogue, and many of them are in our Facebook group. We have two groups, one for our paying customers and one for our just our fans, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com. And then we've got the page, and we do videos and have a YouTube and, and many of those other things. Uh, and, and I don't think that it's this page. I'm not attacking you personally, dear Facebook liker. Uh, I think it's just a, a, a trend that I'm seeing in society. I, I work, like I said, for a nationally syndicated radio show, and I, I do the digital for them. So I interact with tens of thousands of people a day. And I see many of the same trends across the, the spectrum and across the, <laughs> the spectrum being a key word there. Uh, across these different Facebook pages. And for something that I run, I want to um, try and do better. I, I, I'm frustrated by the binary nature of social media. So I think what happens with social media and humans in general is that we want to try and get everything down to two choices. It's either left or right. It's good or evil. It's Republican or Democrat. It's uh, just always, you know, one or the other. Because the way that the human brain works is we want to preserve calories. So if you're thinking too much, then that means your brain is working too hard and it doesn't like that because it wants to survive because in reality we're animals. And so what it does is it tries to narrow down choice into two choices. And then it, it works less that way. And so we are able to survive and propagate the species. But the problem with that is that human nature and human behavior is so much more complex than just two choices. And I think that many of you who are watching this or listening to this on the podcast understand that. And that's why you're fans of We Are Libertarians, if you're fans. Uh, many of you on the Facebook page make it quite clear that you're not. Uh, but I'd love for you guys to be. I'd love for you guys to check out the podcast, for you to engage in dialogue with us, and to try and understand where we're coming from a little bit more. Uh, because that's... I, I read every single comment on the Facebook page, and uh, I'm always interested in what people have to say and the different ideas that they have. But I also get tired of the dumb comments, and uh, I'm probably not as gracious, gracious as I should be. Uh, uh, I probably shouldn't have access to our own Facebook page. I just, I get pissed off, okay? I'm, I get mad. Uh, and I think if you're a libertarian who has been in the libertarian movement for 15 years, or any just libertarian, period, you just, like, you go to these Facebook, you listen to talk radio, or you turn on Rachel Maddow, and you just go, what a fucking idiot. <laughs> and I just expect our people to do a little better. So, uh, when, when, uh, what we do here at We Are Libertarians is try to bring nuance to politics, and we also try to do it in a fun and different way than you might have seen anywhere else. If you listen to our podcast, 
what we do is political it's like meet the press meets howard stern or uh to, to give you kind of two big cultural references it's like you're f sitting around with your friends around the dinner table this is literally my dinner table that i grew up on my spiral notebook uh imprints are all over the table here and we've got you know anywhere from three to f six people sitting around the table on any given episode having a conversation about a single topic and trying to bring a lot of nuance into that discussion and trying to give as many facts as we can grab onto them. We're not the type of talk radio that tells you that we know everything because we certainly don't. We're regular guys and gals uh, who are just trying to figure out the world as best as we can given the information that has been given to us and trying to give as accurate of a, of, of a view of what is happening in the world today as we can find and not worrying about trying to fit it into our tribe because the problem with modern politics today especially on social media is that it's all tribe based it's literally pick up your weapons get behind the barricade for one of the two sides that's not that's not who we are libertarians is that's not what we believe we believe that there are different there, there, there's facts that support what Republicans think are right, and there's facts that th Democrats, and then there's facts that none, neither of them are right. There's different ideas out there that we're always trying to work through. And so what we really want out of a Facebook community is people respecting other people's opinions. Uh, you can disrespect ours. That's fine. Whatever. But when you come to our page, please try to be respectful of the other commenters on that thread. Because what we're trying to do is have a discussion and trying to f argue politics in the classical sense of the word, taking your set of facts and your worldview, discussing it with another person and trying to come to some sort of agreement based on these sets of facts and information and learning new things from different people to come to a more accurate view of what is happening in the world. And... What I see a lot of on social media is binary thinking. It is posting something, I'll, I'll post something through the day that will be picked up, it, 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 it'll be a subtle message that seems like it's a right-leaning thing. And it may be, because there are some things, like Donald Trump, Neil Gorsuch was a win for libertarians. He, did, he was right there. Uh, his his uh, desire to want to bomb North Korea is absolutely foolish. And if you listen to our North Korean podcast that we did last week or the week before, you understand why. Uh, we give our full presentations. What Facebook does not allow you to do is to give you a full accounting in a, in a broad sense of nuance of... Uh, of the entire narrative and the, and the facts that fit into context. And so what ends up happening is just kind of a shit show. And uh, as a result, you get a lot of shit posting. Now, we are pretty well known within the Liberty Movement for being irreverent, for being uh, shit posters, uh, which is basically somebody who just posts something inflammatory to get a response. And sometimes I do do that. And I do that because I want to foster conversation. And the reason that I do that is because it works. I need to get your attention. I want to get your attention because I think that We Are Libertarians has something to say that no other libertarian or political outlet has to say. We are different than anything else that you have ever heard. And I need to get your attention so you can pay attention to what we're doing because I think we have a valuable message and product for you to consume. Uh, and if you were to look at the analytics, you would see that shit posting does way better at getting your attention. And that's sad. Uh, it, it sucks that it is that way, but it is that way. That's what people respond to. They respond to the inflammatory. That's why there is a big, uh, Donald, I wanted to say big Cheeto man, but like, that's rude. Like he is the president of the United States. Uh, but that's, he just shit posted his way to the white house. So, uh, it does work. It's what gets attention in this modern media age. And as much as I hate that personally, I do have to use that to our advantage sometimes to get your attention as a liker of our Facebook page. And, uh, but what, what I always try to do on any given day is give you a lot of 
good information that if you click the link or if you read the post or if you watch the video, you're going to see something that may spark some sort of thought or something that will uh, give you information that will make you sound smarter when you talk to your friends. I'm not trying to just shit post for shit post sake, okay? Uh, I, I think that it is important for us to um, have fun, not take all of this so seriously, to have an authentic and open and honest discussion about politics without so much emotion and temper and anger and just junk. Like, it just sucks. Like, it sucks to log on to Facebook every day. I don't know about you guys. I'm tired of it. Like, I have a, I have an iPhone 7. I love it. But it's ruining my brain. It's ruining my life because I'm logging on and I'm just looking at a bunch of angry people saying a bunch of dumb shit all the time. And I'm sick of it. Like, I just hate it. And what I, I, I just uh, don't want our community to be like that. I don't think libertarians should be like that. Yes, there are things that we should be angry about. I'm angry about a lot of stuff when it comes to politics. Uh, y you take something like North Korea. It's so easy for some of these conservatives to sit there and say, uh, you know, just trust the military. They know what they're doing. Donald Trump has information that you don't have. Well, yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, I'm just a libertarian podcaster. Uh, but I also, as a professional communicator, understand propaganda when I see it. And I understand that many of our baby boomer conservative friends are just full of propaganda and nonsense. And uh, I want to correct that. And then it just becomes an exhausting argument on Facebook and you just go, is that worth it? Uh, so I don't want people to come to our Facebook page and walk away going, was that worth it? Like, are these people that I want to interact with? So uh, I also want to just say that we're not affiliated with the Libertarian Party. Uh, we're not affiliated with the Republican Party, and we're definitely not affiliated with the Democratic Party. We're not anarchists. We are uh, constitutional Republicans. We believe in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we revere the founding of this country. Uh, we believe that the... the uh, political rhetoric by the right employing the Constitution is also uh, often uh, way overblown and hokey. Like, you look at Mark Levin's set and you just go, like, dude, you're being, <laughs> you're being over the top. Of course, there's uh, the, the, the declaration behind me, but, uh, you know, but at the same time, like, I genuinely love and respect any libertarian who is doing anything to further their view of the libertarian cause. We promote Roger Paxton and the Lava Flow. Roger is an anarcho-capitalist who is somebody that I don't agree with um, in a lot of ways, but I promote his show because I think he is a valuable voice in the libertarian movement. Uh, I believe that there are a lot of people who are in the Republican Party, the Libertarian Party, uh, outside of politics, who don't believe that politics is even worth our time, uh, who, who are just in think tank areas, who are deserving of our respect. And libertarians too often are so quick to jump into that same tribalism and start bashing, uh, uh, you know, argue over minarchism and anarcho-capitalism and anarcho-communism and just be a dick about things. And listen, I, I'm guilty of that too. I recognize that I am a hypocrite of it. Uh, and because I, I knee jerk react like so many of us on Facebook and I, I try to do better. And I think that all of us should try to do better and try to be more respectful because there are people out there who are doing work for libertarianism that is really good work. Nick Sarwak is doing good work for the libertarian movement. Tom Woods is doing exceptional work for the libertarian movement. There's no reason for the two of them or their followers to be at odds. Like, the enemy are people who are trying to grow government and build a state that is slowly taking away our natural rights and our freedoms. That's our enemy. Progressives are our enemy. They are not American. And there are progressives in both the right and the left. People who believe that the government is the answer to our problems. That worshipping a standing military is more patriotic than exercising your First Amendment rights. 
That's not what the founders ever in, in, intended. It's not now. When I say standing military, I don't mean uh, dishonoring soldiers or the sacrifices of people that fought in wars, because too often libertarians are so anti-police, anti-military, and that's not something that we believe in. Uh, there are people who who have served our country and have done so to genuinely defend our freedom, even when the policies were so incorrect and wrong and awful. And uh, if we were to go to war with North Korea, I would be so incredibly opposed to a war with North Korea. But I would respect any person that signed up to go and fight in those wars because uh, they're braver than I am. And... You, you can call me a uh, state-sucking parasite or whatever, but that's just what I believe. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, you're kind of who I'm talking about. Like, I have a different view. And you can listen to my view and hear my view and understand how I came to that view. Or you can just dismiss me and walk away and unlike the page, and that's fine. You do that. Because honestly, I don't want to take the effort to argue with you. I'd rather take my time talking to people on our Facebook page and in our Facebook group... Uh, and and talk about where I'm wrong or where I can do better. Like I'm, I, 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 I'm, uh, I started the podcast because in 2012, because having worked in radio 10 years before for a, a long period of time now working again in radio, I can tell you that doing a show is the best way to prepare your mind and and to kind of understand the arguments that are out of that. Because when I sit down behind the microphone on Tuesdays and Thursday nights, I have to have something to say. <laughs> and I don't want to just spout out whatever Mark Levin said that day or Glenn Beck or whatever one of these guys say or Rachel Maddow from the left or even what Tom Woods or Jason Stapleton are saying. I want to see something different and have a different perspective. And to do that, I've got to really prepare and have a lot of information. But I can't read everything that's out there in the world, and that's the beauty of crowdsourcing information. And that's really one of the great benefits of We Are Libertarians is that we have built a community where we can all kind of crowdsource information and have a conversation about where we can do things differently and better. Um, but it demands that people treat each other with respect and call me out when I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm petty. <laughs> like, I'm real petty. It's... It runs in my family, okay? I'm from southern Indiana. And if you know anybody from southern Indiana, they're a pain in the fucking ass. <laughs> and I admit that. So uh, I, I just uh, wanted to take a chance to kind of introduce ourselves, introduce what we do, introduce the kind of community that we would like to build on this Facebook page, and uh, invite you to be a part of it. And... I don't really, I block people sometimes, but that's just when they're just way over the top. Um, but I, I figured if, if I said kind of who we are and what we believe in and how we kind of do things, that maybe some of you guys on the Facebook page who see our posts pretty regularly would, would kind of help self-police a little bit and just uh, help us. If you, if you believe in what we're doing and the values that we believe in, that you'll kind of help uh, reinforce those. You know, even if you don't agree with the policies or the principles of what we're saying in some of the posts, that you will offer a differing opinion in a way that helps us understand where you're coming from, as opposed to just sharply calling us an asshole. Uh, because I just don't like, like I'm a professional communicator and I am a petty piece of shit, and I'm just going to be better at being a petty piece of shit professional communicator than you are and I have a lot more time than you <laughs> and I like I just would rather not spend my time being a petty piece of shit all day uh, I, I, I I'm I'm doing this to inform people and to try and grow the libertarian movement and introduce people to libertarian ideas and I think that that's really hard uh, when you you don't um, respect the other person you're talking to and that's all i'm really kind of asking for is call us on our shit as page admins and as as uh, political commentators but do it in a way that helps us understand where you're coming from and i treat people the way that i'm treated and i will treat you with respect if you treat us with respect and if not i will make a meme out of you and i will put uh 
like Greg and I, uh, my co-host Greg, Harry and Kat are also co-hosts. We're just sick and demented people. Like Greg, uh, like James, who's on our cast, is a moderator of 4chan poll uh, and be random. And that means he's one of the most powerful people on the shit tier of the internet. <laughs> like, and we joke with each other and we sort of lost touch with what is reality. Uh, so sometimes we post stuff and then I go, was that appropriate? Or was that too offensive? Like, and then we all kind of look at each other and go, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, we've kind of lost sight of what's appropriate and what's not. Uh, and we may not be appropriate or, uh, we, and we may be offensive and, uh, we're just going to be us and then we're going to do that. And, and if you like it, that's cool. If you don't like it, fine. I am not here to speak for all libertarianism. I'm not here to represent the Libertarian Party. I'm not here to represent Republicans. I'm not here to represent anybody but my own opinions. Uh, I, I, I refuse to be a spokesperson for an entire group of people because I don't believe that libertarians should do that. I think you can explain the ideology from your point of view, but I don't think that libertarians can necessarily speak for every libertarian. I just don't think that's possible. I think uh, it's unhealthy when they do that. And I think it's unhealthy for you as somebody who is a consumer of libertarian media to force that role on people. Um, because it, it just it causes problems for those human beings. And, you know, it's just kind of, I don't know, cult of personalities in the libertarian movement is kind of gross. Uh, promote people's work and respect people that you like and that you learn from, but like just be careful to not to get into worship because that's certainly nothing we want to be involved in. And and we uh, we we certainly it's it's like I love Ron Paul, but like the cult of personality around Ron Paul, just to me, I go you know like the, he's a guy, he's he has his opinions. It doesn't mean that everything that comes out of Ron Paul's mouth is right. You can disagree with Ron Paul, but the second you disagree with Ron Paul, you've got 8 million sycophants on social media going after you, and it just, it, it kind of sucks. Um, so, I don't know what, then change your name to what you represent, you brickhead means, uh, from Parala. I'm on Facebook Live, so I'm just going to take a look at some of your comments to see if there's anything worth reading. If Maybe this is, is getting through to some of you, uh, or if I'm doing a good job of explaining myself. Uh, obviously, uh, Perla, I'm not good at names, by the way. Uh, yes, that is Hillary Clinton behind me. Donald Trump is on the wall over there. I got it last Halloween and I put them up on the wall. Uh, this is the, the board section. And then eventually I'm going to put the TV over here. Um, you know, the, the, this is our studio, which is basically in my apartment. Uh, this is a, a window behind me and then a, a curtain, a wall here and then there's a curtain rod that goes over here and a bookshelf with a bunch of stuff over there and then uh, that's my kitchen back there and then back over on this wall I've got a lot of my political buttons I collect political buttons and this is an autograph from David Letterman that I got uh, in the early days of the internet and Letterman is one of my absolute heroes uh, and yes I know he's a leftist piece of garbage but I uh, respect what he did uh, Hillary Clinton is up there for no other reason than satire uh, I am, uh, I absolutely cannot stand the woman, but I thought it was just, uh, funny to put her face up there. Um, it doesn't look like, yes, I have an iPhone, uh, that th there's not much on the Facebook comments. So anyways, I hope you found this helpful and I hope that this helps explain who we are a little bit and what we believe and how we like to do things. Uh, we like good natured shit posting, good natured ribbing. We don't like sharp, negative, mean comments. Uh, we're very sensitive. And by the, we, I mean me. And uh, I run, I am the head honcho of this hacienda. Okay, so, uh, and I don't think anybody else does. So, if you found this to be helpful, please share it, comment on it, like it. Because what that does is that tells the Facebook algorithm that you want to see more of this and your friends should see it and other people who like our page should see it. I will also say that if you like what we do, up at the top of the page, go to the page, click following, and then you can choose see first and you can see all the stuff that we post and get in on the discussion. You can join the Facebook group at wearelibertarians.com 
add us on Patreon. Uh, we have $1,000 a month that we're bringing in on Patreon because of the great audience that we have built over the last six years. And what I'm going to do is continue to build tools for the libertarian movement. So working on a few projects and uh, we're going to keep making new libertarians. That's what this is about. It's about making new libertarians and secondly, about informing the current libertarians. So if you like what we're doing, please share our stuff, comment on our stuff, stuff share our stuff, like it. Uh, and engage with us, that would be ever so helpful. And we will love you forever. And thank you so much for liking the page. Uh, I know I started out a little hard on you. I said hard on. Uh, we started out a little hard on you, but I hope that we've come to a good understanding. And I feel like I've talked too long. I've said too much. Um, but uh, that's why I'm a libertarian podcaster. And no, this is not my mom's basement. This is my luxury apartment in Indianapolis. And if you think about stealing this stuff, I have cameras and uh, I will shoot you if you come in. So, all right. Thanks for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. And thank you for being a part of what we do here. I greatly appreciate you being a part of the libertarian community and working to make it a better place uh, and for keeping us honest, as I will always keep those dirty statists honest as well. So thanks. And we will see you next Thursday.